Amen. And I invite you to remain standing in honor of the reading of God's holy, inspired, and inerrant word at Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 to 25 this morning. And as you're turning there, I will remind us just a little bit of the context of Hebrews. We've been in Hebrews a couple of times in this series about the church. And today we come to a text which is a summary of gospel privileges and an exposition of gospel patterns or practices. But even before I read it, we need to remember what's going on in this letter. The author is writing to a group of Jewish Christians who are being tempted to turn away from the faith, to go back to old practices. And in order to exhort them to hold fast, he first of all lays out the beauties, the glories of the gospel, of the new covenant. In essence, saying, how could you turn away from such a glorious thing? And then he exhorts them. So when we come to this text, this is one of those pivot texts. The first part of it summarizes, it's been argued to this point, summarizes the gospel privileges, the blessings of being in Christ. And then he goes to some exhortations. So with that in mind, let's turn Hebrews 10, starting at verse 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you before your word this morning, and we ask that you might speak. We recognize afresh Christ the King, Christ the head of his body, the church, and so we would hear from you. Help us in following your word this morning. To be amazed afresh at what you have done for us in Christ. We who are believers, Lord, and in danger of taking lightly these glorious things, stir us anew. And even those who hear, who do not know you, draw them to these glorious realities. And then help us to live faithfully in light of them. And we ask in Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Well, I want you to see, to notice the flow of this text before we walk through it. So we're just going to follow the exact flow of it. Uh, notice there in verses 19 and through 21, there's a therefore. I've alluded to that already. He's summarizing what's come before. But then he says there in verse 19, since we have something. And then in verse 21, since we have. So he opens with reminding us of two things we have. That's what I call the gospel privileges. Two benefits of the new covenant. And then, really, uh, this is all one sentence. Since we have this and since we have that. We don't have a main verb yet. Notice verse 22. Let us draw near. Verse 23, let us hold fast. Verse 24, let us consider. Since we have, since we have, let us, let us, let us. That's why I sometimes call this the salad sermon. (laughs) Hopefully it's not tossed uh, and it didn't come from Caesar. But you see, two things we have in Christ 
and three things we're called to do. So it's a straightforward flow, and we want to take those up in order. So first of all, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus. Now he's talking to believers, we know that. We know that because this is a letter to churches, but even when he says, therefore, brothers. So brothers and sisters, believers, he reminds us, remember that in Christ, that because of the gospel, we have confidence to enter the holy places. I would just label this access. We have access to God. And I'm going to linger here just a minute because I think probably every one of you, when you came in this morning, you knew this, and I hope not to insult you here, but I'm going to bet that many, perhaps most of us, have somewhat taken it for granted. We know this. We've probably, many of you are like me, and that you've known this for a long time. You may have been in a situation, like I have, it was helpful to me, where somebody said, oh my goodness, did you realize that when you trust Christ, you have direct access to the Father? And I've learned, I've got a pretty good church face, so I didn't say what immediately came to my mind, but what immediately came to my mind was, oh yeah, of course I knew that. But I was convicted. Because I thought, this person has the right response to that. This person is amazed at that. This person is glorying in this. And I'm saying, oh yeah, you know, what's so big about that? We need to be reminded afresh of this. And again, in this flow of thought, one of the reasons that the author is putting this forward is because this is one of the things that will help the people, help us, not be sucked back into the world by remembering what a great privilege this is. Now, this book is labeled Hebrews. That's because he's writing to Jewish Christians. So these are people who know the Old Testament. They know, they're very aware, we may forget, we don't tend to know our Old Testaments very well, and by the way, here's a reminder of why that's so useful, but we need to be reminded that in the Old Covenant, not everybody had that access. Already earlier in this book, he has pointed out that in the Old Covenant, one man, one time a year, came into that presence of God. They knew it was a serious thing. They knew he had to go in in a certain way, lest he die. They tied a rope to his ankle in case he didn't come out after a while so they could drag the dead body out and not go in and get him. They knew the story of Nadab and Abihu. I may have alluded to this earlier. They knew those two sons of Aaron who, while they went about their work of the sacrifices, and this is early, early in the time when they have put the tabernacle together. But the scripture says they offered strange fire. It doesn't tell us what that is, but in other words, they did the sacrifices in a different way than what they were prescribed. What I imagine, and it's only a guess, is that it might have been something like this. Hey, Nadab, what have I who? We've been doing this the same way every time. Let's just change it up a little bit. And when they did, God struck them dead. The, the, Paul falls over the whole place. Aaron's frustrated with God. God speaks to Moses and says, You tell them, I will be regarded as holy by all those who draw near to me. If I can put that in West Tennessee, don't toy with me. It is a serious thing. For sinful people like me and like you to come into a presence, the presence of a holy God. This is one thing in our kind of church culture that it's easy to forget, easy to miss. In the Bible Belt kind of around us, there's the idea that God loves everyone. Okay, that's a biblical thought. But then we align that over into he's happy with whatever we do. That's not a biblical idea. It is a dangerous thing for sinful people to come into the presence of a holy God. In fact, we cannot endure it. 
without some sort of provision. And what he's reminding us here is, remember that we can come this way by the blood of Jesus. Now you know this, but recognize we would be destroyed if we tried to approach this holy God except for the work of Christ. That's the reason that we have at any time of any day the privilege of speaking to God. And because we've had that privilege at any time of any day for probably quite a while for many of us, that's when we can take things for granted. And this text is telling us, be amazed anew that the Lord would allow us into his presence and not just allow it, that he would provide the way at such cost to himself to bring messed up people like you and me into his presence. Now, if we think in human terms, we would probably think, wow, okay, so if he went to that much trouble, he must have really needed something from us. What is it that we're bringing to him? Trouble? Not for his own sake, but for ours. For the sake of his own glory and demonstrating his mercy to children of wrath. Demonstrating his graciousness to those who could not earn his favor. This is what he's getting at when he says, we have confidence to enter into the holy places. Now, this confidence to enter, this this access. And uh, one way, I, when I'm dealing with something that I know well, maybe too well, and I need to see it afresh, I, I just try to imagine another way of thinking about it. So since this is about access, then uh, and, and access that's not open to just anybody, then what comes to my mind is, um, you know, top secret things and top secret access because I have a lot of experience with that with a few mo- movies I've watched. Um, so when I think about kind of top secret access, then it seems to me, from what I actually read a little bit on, um, there's always going to be a background check, right? And you, you, you shouldn't have certain things in your background, especially maybe treason or those kind of things, you should be disallowed. And, and not just anybody, you, you must be somebody important. So I imagine in my mind's eye, me, coming to request access into the presence of God, coming on my own, just me. And again, in my mind's eye, which is a little weird, there's an angel at a computer. So I come up and they say, name, I tell them my name, they type it in. They're going to see if I am important enough, and it just says, nobody. Well, to humor me, he does the background check and to see if there are any crimes on my account. And the screen just begins to scroll. Now, it need not have murder or robbery, but it has various other ways in which I have rebelled against the king in which I've conspired with the enemy, where I've committed treason against the Most High, and I'm cast out on my ear. How dare you think you could have access to this? And yet I know that's my status. But in my mind's eye, I come back again. This time, by the blood of Jesus. Now, again, in my mind's eye, the angel recognizes me and thinks, great, here we go again. But he punches in to see my status, and where it once said nobody, it now says, child of the king. And he says, okay, but let's check out your your record again. And he puts in the record, and nothing comes up. It simply says, stamped, washed in the blood of the lamb, access granted. That's what this is telling us. Remember, this is your privilege in the gospel. And if you've never trusted Jesus, if you're not repented of your sins, if you're not given up on any other way of being right with him, this is not your access. You are barred. And you will eventually face this holy God, but in judgment and wrath. But this privilege is is available to you today also by the blood of Jesus. But that's only the first benefit he mentions. He mentions a second. 
when he says, since we have a great priest over the house of God. Now, what's he saying there? You probably can guess, but if you've been reading along in the book, he's already mentioned that Jesus is the great priest. In the Old Testament, there was Aaron, but we see the issues there. In the line of Aaron, there would be a priest, but he had to offer sacrifices for his own sin and then for the people, and then that uh, priest would die, and you'd have to make another one. But there was this Melchizedek, and he's mentioned that Jesus is a priest in the order of Melchizedek. That is, he does not die. He continues forever, and he is one who's been tipped in it every way as we are yet without sin. He is the holy and pure one. So since we have such a great priest. But still, probably most of us didn't grow up with priests. Uh, I did not. We're not really supposed to after the Old Covenant. So we may not have quite an image of that. But if you think about it in simple terms, from the Old Testament, the priest was one who went to God on behalf of the people and then to the people on behalf of God. He was a representative. So again, if I just toy with that in my own mind and think of, okay, in the political realm, we elect representatives. So we want somebody to represent us. And again, if we think of a good representative, then probably there are some basic things we hope for. And and amongst them, we would want somebody who has some clout so that when they speak up there on our behalf, they can get something done. And we want somebody who understands life where we are. Right? If, we get, if we have somebody that lives right next door to me and he understands our community, understands our needs, but nobody listens when he talks, that doesn't help. If we have you know, a powerhouse who gets everything done, but he doesn't know what life's like for us, then he might not help us. So we probably want those two things. So who is our great priest before the Father? He is the one who in chapter 1 of this book says that by his word, All things were created and all things hold together. The one who, again, the first part of this book says is greater than Moses, greater than the angels. The one who is the very son of God, the one who is God himself. This one has made himself willing to be our priest. But but then again, we might say, well, yeah, but can he understand what life is for me? Well, I just alluded to that other text that He is one who has been tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. And that's why he is able to comfort those of us who are tempted. This is our priest. We could hope for nothing better. And the way these two go together is, Jesus has opened the door for us to have access to God. And then, because he so graciously knows our own failings, he did not merely open the door, but he stays there to keep his foot in it because he knows quite well if it were left to us, we'd slam the door on our own faces. I mean, you think about it. If the message of the gospel was, if you repent of your sins and trust Jesus, then all your sins will be washed away and you can know God. But if ever after that you sin again, you're out, we might as well all give up. The priesthood of Christ is his work of continuing to intercede for us, to continue to hold open the door and to invite us in. These are these two great gospel blessings. Now, another thing that happens in our kind of setting is that we might glory in these gospel truths, but we might miss that if we really believe them, then they come out through our lives. If they're not shaping who we are and how we live, then we haven't truly embraced them. So in light of that, he tells us to do three certain things. Notice the first one, verse 22. Let us draw near with a true or sincere heart in full assurance of faith. Let's pause there for a minute. Draw near. This is a word that was used in chapter 4. I've alluded to that text and and other places here in Hebrews. And in every instance, it's a word for worship. Draw near to God. In this context, he says, let us, it's plural. Uh, This kind of worship is something we do together and individually. But essentially, he's saying, how should we live in light of these great truths? and, And how do we live in light of these truths so as not to get sucked in by the world? Point one Use what God has given you. 
If he has made an access way for you to come to God, then come to God. Worship him. Worship him here together. Worship him privately through the week. You don't appreciate a gift if you never use it. You've probably had that happen, either as the recipient of a gift or the giver of a gift. Maybe you're the giver, and somebody says, oh, thank you, thank you, and then you realize they never used it. Well, somehow you missed the bag or, you know, whatever. God, at great cost to himself, has opened the door. If we don't make use of it, we despise that access to God. We fail to recognize the awe, the beauty, the wonder of that. And and it's very easy. I have walked this path myself of seeing this amazing privilege of access to God as a duty, as something to check off my list. Did I check that off my list this morning? Oh, how cold has my heart become at that point? It would be as if in the morning when I see my wife, I say, hey, how are you doing? And I pull out my little notebook, check. And then I say, I love you, check. And then she's about to step out the door and I say, wait a minute, let me see what else is on here that I need to make sure I do. And I say a few other nice things. That's not that helpful. I know what my wife would say to me. If these things are real, these things arise. Now the reality though is, Our hearts grow cold. It's part of our fallen condition. So the other thing that people will say is, well, you know, I didn't really feel like it, so I didn't feel like I didn't think I should pray. I don't like to be fake. I think it was Martin Luther who said, you should pray when you feel like it because it would be a shame to waste the opportunity. And you should pray when you don't feel like it because you need to get to feel like it. If you say, well, my heart's cold, I don't think I should read the scriptures, or it seems flat to me, dead to me, I don't think. No, pursue the Lord. This also is what comes up in marriage counseling from time to time. Somebody says, yeah, I'm just kind of, I'm not feeling it. Pursue until you feel. It's not that our affections are meaningless, but it is that our feelings are unstable and are not a faithful guide. So yes, our feelings towards the Lord ebb and flow, wax and wane. But we need to appreciate afresh these things and say, oh, if I'm thinking rightly, what a privilege it is to draw near to God. Now he mentions that we do this in full assurance of faith. That is, fully trusting. This isn't saying make sure you have strong enough faith at this level and you can't come in if it's at this level it's not talking about the strength of our faith it's talking about the assurance of what God has done so fully trusting with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water here again he's using Old Testament imagery about how things were cleansed and purified to be used in God's presence so he's talking again about the purifying work of the gospel our repentance this is one of the reasons why in our worship service We have that corporate confession of sin followed by a pronouncement of our forgiveness in the gospel reminding us that this is part of coming into the presence of God. But there's this interesting phrase here that our hearts need to be sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. What's that? Now we know the scripture speaks approvingly of our conscience and not sinning against our conscience. So what is an evil conscience? I think it's what the Puritans refer to as a smiting conscience. Because our conscience is still fallible. We want it to be shaped by the word of God. The more we take in God's word, the more helpful it is. But it is fallible. And we can end up not believing the gospel for ourselves. So in practical terms, here's what I think the evil conscience looks like in certain situations. You go to pray. Maybe by yourself at home in the morning. You go to read the Bible. Or or when you gather here in worship. Maybe this even happened this morning for some of you. And you go to engage the worship of God in one part or another. And you kind of hear this voice inside you of, who are you? 
Yeah, you're going through the motions, but I know you. I know those thoughts you had on the way in this morning. I know this sin about you and that sin about you. Who are you to draw near to God? That's the evil conscience. We don't deal with the evil conscience by saying, I'm still pretty good. Did you see the guy over on that pew? I'm still pretty good compared to him. No, notice what he said. With our hearts sprinkled clean. That's the image in the Old Testament of the blood of the sacrifice being sprinkled on by the work of Christ. We have an enemy. There is an accuser of the brethren. The name devil means quite literally slanderer. We have an enemy of our souls who will heap up again to remind us of our sins, things that the Lord has forgiven and will bring them against us. And when we draw near to worship, because he wants to keep us from that, we'll bring up these ideas and we'll say, who are you to come near to God? And here we should borrow a page from Martin Luther and talk back to the devil. When he says, who are you to draw near to God? We should answer something like a worm. Because you say, you're a worm, you're useless. I am. You're a sinner. I am. But behold the worm's God. I come not on my merit, but on his. You tell me I'm a sinner, and I say that is good news because it is sinners whom Christ has invited. And because he has invited, I draw near. And you have no thing to say against me. These are part of the beauties of the gospel that gives us tools to deal with this evil, this smiting conscience. So let us draw near. But there's a second one. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Hold fast. Now the confession of our hope, what's he getting at? Remember he's talking to people who are tempted to turn away, to go to other things, and he's saying, no, look at the hope of the gospel. Look what this is. You know God here and now, and there's coming a resurrection. All this is worthwhile. This is our great and glorious hope. He says, let us hold fast to this. Don't let go. The word here for hold fast is a word from which we get catechism or catechesis, this language we use for teaching basic truths that we want people to hold fast to. And when I think of this, this exhortation to hold fast, I remember the very first time my family and I visited Edinburgh Castle. If you go there, there are a lot of neat things there, including several military museums. And we were walking through, and there are exhibits for different things that had happened, and different great stories and feats of heroism. But there was this one. It was in the era when uh, now gunpowder is being used, uh, but they're still horseback, and they're still using the uh, flags to direct uh, people and things. There was this exhibit in honor of a man who had the task of holding up the banner as they went into battle. Now, I've not been in battle, but I would think if I were in his case, I'd rather have a gun than a flag. But that's his deal. And the flags are crucial for the movement of forces. If you lose that, you're in big trouble. It's a big deal. So they go into battle. And he's shot and he falls. Well, the other guys around know we've got to get the flag, the banner, and we've got to raise it again. So they hurry there, and the man is dead, but they can't pry his fingers loose. It's desperate. It's got to go up, but we we can't get his fingers off of it. So in the end, they end up having to gather him up and hold his body in order to hold the flag. Now, they tell me that medically there may be something going on there. But I'm taken by what it is they're celebrating there. This man was told, hold fast to this. The good of your brothers depends on this. Do not let go. You can't let it go in fear. You can't run away from it. You need to hold fast to this till you die. And this man died and didn't let go even in his death. This is what this text is saying to you and to me. Let us hold fast our hope. There are people all around us in in our country today who are saying, I used to believe that stuff. I grew up with that stuff. Not anymore. All the more in that kind of setting, brothers and sisters, let us hold 
fast the hope of our confession. Let us be those who say, I don't always understand. I can't answer all the questions, but I'm going to die with that hope in my hand and God helping me, you won't be able to pry my fingers loose in death. Hold fast. Hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. It doesn't mean that we, we ourselves aren't you know, tossed about, but the anchor of that hope is Christ and he is sure. But notice there's a four, there's a ground, there's a reason. And it's not, hold fast the confession of our hope, for you can do it. For life's not really that hard. No, because those things aren't true. It is for he who promised is faithful. The reason we can hold fast is not in ourselves, but is in God. Matthew Henry on this text says, we must trust more in God's promises to us than in our promises to God. So here again, I think of a story in our first year teaching at Union before we went on to Scotland. So our children are quite small. We just have two at the time. We lived in Cherry Grove Apartments. I'm not sure what it's like now, but at that time, the parking lot was one of the most dangerous places in the world. People drove crazy through there. So we took our very young children from time to time, early on, to where the sidewalk ended and the asphalt started. You know, there's a real difference in the color. And we said to them, you do not cross this line without us. Out there is danger. You stay here unless you go with us. Well, also, you had to take your garbage to the uh, dumpster out there in the parking lot. So I would carry the garbage out there. And my oldest, Nathan, at that time, very young, maybe one, maybe two, he wants to take the garbage with me. Well, of course we're going to do that. Tie him up a little uh, Kroger bag with a little garbage. He takes his, and I take mine. And we walk up to the line. But when we get to the line, I reach my hand down to him, and I say, buddy, hold my hand and hold fast. Don't let go. Remember, it's dangerous out here. So his little hand reaches up to my much larger hand, and off we go. And most times, we make it there and back, and he obeys, he holds fast, and all is well. But sometimes, along the journey, there's something shiny or whatever else. And the little hand lets go. And what do I do? Do I jump back and say, you let go, son, it's on you. No. I hold on to him. I exhort him, hold fast because there's danger. And that's his duty to do so. But the hope of his perseverance is not his small hand, but is my larger hand. And that's what this text is saying. We need to hold fast. Don't let go, but you know you're weak. You know how feeble you are. So even as you hold fast, remember that the source of our hope, our safety, is not in our feeble little hand, but in the mighty hand of God. So hold fast. Then the third one. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Now this these two verses are probably the most famous in this text, but I, I want to press us into it just a little bit. So let us consider one another. Uh, the verb that's used here is a, a, a verb used in more negative connotations in some other places. Um, the way I can kind of summarize it in the colloquial might be uh, saying something like, I'm going to watch you like a hawk. Now normally if somebody says that to you, it's not a good thing coming. But we get that it's a very careful watching. So it's almost as if he says, brothers and sisters, tell one another, I'm going to watch you like a hawk. And the very first chance I get, I'm going to stir you up to love and good deeds. Oh, okay. Now this ties to the things we've been talking about. This ties to loving one another and recognizing that we need one another. This goes to the thing where I said, how can the body be healthy if 20% are missing? Well, 
if we are watching one another like a hawk, then what we're saying is you are not going to just disappear. It's back to what I talked about of the church covenant. What we're saying to one another is we will link arms with you and we do not intend to make it to heaven without you. You may fight yourself out, but you will not simply slip through the cracks. Nobody slips through the cracks because we are watching over one another in order to stir one another up to love and good deeds. Now, even this phrase, stir one another up, it's actually a word, and that's used elsewhere in the New Testament to talk about inciting a riot. So it's a word that also can kind of have a negative implication, and this is a little bit overdoing it, but just to make a point, it's as if he's saying, watch everybody carefully, not to catch them and be difficult, but in order to help and bless and incite a riot of loving good deeds. As if at the um, announcement time uh, next week, Pastor Douglas is going to come up here and say, whoa, people, listen, calm it down. There's so many loving good deeds going on. We can't keep up with everything. This is kind of getting out of hand. Now, of course, he wouldn't say that. But that's the picture here. We can't do that. We can't do that effectively if we don't know one another. That's back to that consider, watch out, know, recognize one another. Spend enough time with one another. Talk to one another enough that you might know where such need uh, shows up and how you might encourage and how you might stir up. This is what the church looks like. Now he goes on to say, that's the positive. The negative is not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some. Now, strangely enough, in the first century, it was the habit of some professing believers not to gather with the church. Isn't that crazy? I'm so glad it doesn't happen today. But it does. And sometimes this is the only part somebody knows of this text. And it's the proof text for why you need to go to church. It's true. It says that. And therefore, to willingly, and I'm not talking about health reasons or anything else, but to willingly have the opportunity to gather with the saints and to refuse to do so is sin. That's just straightforward. There's no other way around it. But it's not just hanging there by itself, you see. The, the point of the whole flow is if we understand and appreciate the gospel, this is how we live. And if we don't want to get sucked in by the world, this is how we live. And because we want to watch over one another and encourage and help and bless why would you want to miss that? It's not about checking attendance. It's not about having enough people for the preacher to feel like he can talk to them. It's about being a body. And we've got to make sure that as we do assemble together, that we are considering one another and that we are stirring up one another to love and good deeds. It's not a checklist, but even if it were, attendance wouldn't be it. It would be, whom did I stir up to love and good deeds this day? This is what it looks like to live out the gospel. Now he goes on to say, all the, all the more as you see the day approaching. That is, as we continue on to the final day, all the more we should be doing these things. And one of the reasons I wanted to take this text today is we've walked through a number of texts that very directly say, this should be true of the church, this is how we should do things. But I wanted to step back to a text that makes clear what's true in all the others. That starts with a gospel exposition and then goes to, this is how we live it. Because I want us to be reminded that even as we think about what we should be as the church, and even as we see places where we're not there yet, the gospel is the dynamo of the church. The gospel is the engine that drives this thing. We can't just say, okay, we need to do A, B, and C that we haven't currently done. Boom, let's do it. It's as we understand and appreciate more and more, more and more deeply, as we're overwhelmed more and more by the glory of the gospel, as we say to the Lord, I want to live out your truths, that's where these things come from. Otherwise, it becomes a legalism. Here, it becomes a joy aware of our feebleness and failures, but even more aware of his glory and grace 
And then these joyful truths can echo out through us. And that is then what is attractive to a watching world. That is what begins to show them there is something here worth noting. So let me ask you to bow your heads with me to consider God's word this morning. I've walked through some of the basic benefits of the gospel. And if you've not trusted Christ, I've spoken directly to you already. And I want to do so again to say, now is an opportunity for you to cry out to God just where you are or even to come and talk to one of the pastors in a minute. Acknowledging your sin and asking Jesus to forgive you of your sins and to make you his own, trusting him only. Or believers, as we sing in a minute, perhaps the main thing you need to do business with God about is taking for granted the glories of the gospel. I need to talk to the Lord about that fairly regularly. Maybe there are other pieces. Maybe there are other things in the living out the gospel where the Lord has pricked your heart and you need to do business with him, praying where you are, coming here and praying, coming and talking to one of the pastors. I simply encourage you to respond to God. Father, we thank you for your word. We could not figure these things out on our own we could not be sure of our own ideas, so we thank you for speaking. And we thank you for how gracious and amazing your gospel is. Help us to be renewed in amazement at the gospel and renewed in faithfulness in living it out. Do your work among us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.